Welcome to Maths with EJD. In this video, I'll go to the next video, next uh, aspect of scientific computing with Python. As usual, I'm starting from this kind of page because I want to show you the process of opening. In case you're getting, you're just getting used to working with Jupyter Notebook, which I talked about in the second video. Of course, the way to do that is, first of all, I'm, I'm going to share my entire screen. So anything I do, you get to see it. So now I'm sharing my entire screen. I can let this can actually go. And then to go to Jupyter Notebook, I just come to my search button. If I'm not seeing it here, I can just start typing. And then I see Anaconda, Jupyter Notebook Anaconda 3. So I click on that. So then it brings out this terminal, this uh, black looking thing. So always the temptation for beginners is to close this as if it's, it doesn't matter. But if you close it, uh, nothing else would work. So it's important to you just minimize it and leave it there. And then you navigate to where your folder is. So my own folder for scientific computing is on the desktop. So I click on desktop here and then I look for it. So I, I find scientific computing with Python here. And then, of course, today we are talking about Python data types. That's under Python, uh, Python variable data types. So I click on Python variable data types. Generally speaking, I should have just done Python variables, but you know, I discovered it's better to treat the two aspects of the variables differently. Now, again, uh, in case, I mean, I like to teach Python in a hands-on manner such that you know, you get the codes because my in my own learning experience too, I tried watching videos and everything. But by the time I want to implement, it's difficult to actually implement. So to make to make your uh, situation not like that, so I've actually compiled. So as I keep doing each uh each lesson, so I, I make the the Jupyter notebook the, the notes I make it available. And if you check the description, you can find a link to where you, uh, you can download all the notes I'm using. And the beauty of that is that you can actually uh, open the notes. In fact, if you have, if you're, if you're working on Google Drive, if you click on the note, it is going to open it in Google Colab. So you're going to see the codes. And then what that helps you with is that you can actually begin to interact with the codes. You can begin to tweak things. Uh, you know, for instance, if I say why is five and why, uh, if I say why is five somewhere, you can change it to fifteen to see what happens. So that way, you begin to learn the rudiments of python in case you are new to it so i mean if you're actually very serious with this uh with this series of t of videos on scientific computing it can actually be your 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 uh, your pathway into learning python so uh you want to take it seriously so again like i said today we are looking at uh, in this video rather we are looking at python variables okay so in and you need to know that in python there are several types of variables that can be used to store different data types, as you can see here. And these data types can be categorized into, uh, 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 I said, in Python, there are several types of variables, right, that can be used to store different kinds of data. So they can be categorized into variable data types and variable data structures, variable data structures. But in this video, I'm focusing on variable data types so that in the next video, I'll talk about variable data structures. All right, so talking about variable data types, right, um, there are five common variable data types in Python. They are integers, floating point numbers, complex numbers, booleans, and strings. But because our focus is on scientific computing, we are going to exclude strings. In strings, we deal a lot with characters. It, it, it talks about it talks about handling characters. You know, like uh, when you have to deal with words uh, like that. So you, you can talk about strings. So that may be useful maybe for a software engineer or maybe. A data analyst. I mean, I teach data analysis in an, on another platform, and you know, there I get to teach strings, and you know, it has a whole lot of uh, things under it. Okay, so talking about integers now, um, as the first type, of course, if you have done some maths, you probably already know. Like if you did year one mathematics in at the undergraduate level, you'll probably know what integers are. Integers are simply whole numbers. Integers are used to store whole numbers without decimal points. For instance, if you say x is 5 and y is minus 3. So these are integers. But of course, I, there's a way to check the type of variable you are dealing with in Python. And for instance, if you say type x, so if you just say type x, x is 5, right? So you type x, it means you're checking the type of integer 5 is. 
you know? So it tells you X is actually an integer. So in the next cell now, I'm checking Y is minus three. So I'm checking type Y. Uh, if I do that, if I run that, it also says type Y is all is integer. You know, it says it's also integer. Now there's a debate. I mean, there used to be a debate, at least as far as I know, whether uh, about whether zero is an integer or not. You know, I mean, maybe this is finally the day we get to settle that fight finally. So if it says Z is zero and we check type Z, let's see, is he an integer or not? So if I run that, oh, it tells me zero is an integer. So then you can say that an integer is a is all it includes all positive and negative whole numbers including and all and zero right so those are integers whole numbers including zero those are integers now so that takes us to the idea of floating point numbers floating point numbers you know floating point numbers are basically um they are, float, they, they are used to store decimal numbers. So once any number involves decimal, then it is actually a floating point. Now, for instance, you have X is 3.14, Y is minus 2.5, Z is 5.0. Normally, 5 is an integer, right? But as far as Python is concerned, once you put decimal, even if what follows is 0, it is seen as an integer. I mean, as a floating point number. For instance, if we, ch if we check type X, if I say type X, and I run that, it says it is float. So... Let me, I want to go to another cell and check type Y, you know, type Y. So since I've declared the Y, so it sees Y as minus 2.5. Is minus 2.5 an integer or a float? So I click, it says it is float. Then I want to check type Z. Though it's, uh, 5 is a whole number, right? But then because you have put 0, 0.0, what does it see it as? Does it still see it as an integer that it was? Now it sees it as float because... I now say it is 5.0. So as far as Python is concerned, 5 is different from 5.0. 5 is integer. 5.0 is floating point number, you know. So it's a decimal number like we like to call it. So it's used, so this kind of uh, floating point numbers actually store decimal numbers. Okay. So we have talked about integers. We've talked about floating point numbers. Now let's talk about complex numbers. Now complex numbers... Uh, you know, I know if you if you uh, interact with physics, with chemistry, I mean, so yeah, physics, engineering, and mathematics, you should have probably come across complex numbers, especially starting from year one, year two in the university, like that. So complex numbers are actually a thing. Now, I, there's this analogy I always like to give. You know, uh, I'll, let me create a cell, right, and to explain what I want to say. Um, okay escape and a that's me creating a cell above so for instance i always like to demonstrate this that in 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 primary school we're taught uh you know if you have three minus two i just want to print this print three minus two the answer is one right now what if but then in primary school in primary school we're told that if you uh three minus two was possible but two minus three was not two minus three. So anytime you had two minus three at the primary in primary school, it was impossible. It was impossible, impossible in elementary school. I mean, in primary school, let me put primary school because that was what the school I attended was called. But guess what? When I got into junior high school, uh, I mean, secondary school, first year, then I attended a six-year secondary school. But of course, that six-year secondary school is a lumping together of three years of junior high school and three years of senior high school. So when I got there, right, we're introduced to the concept of number lines. So and for number lines, we're told that, okay, um, because you can actually, if you draw the number line, right, zero is at the center. So two minus three would mean start from two and move three steps to the left. So if you move from two, you go three steps to the left, so first step, you get to one. Second step, you get to zero. Third step, you get to minus one. As a result of that, print two minus three is actually minus one. All right? So it now became possible in junior high school. But then if, still in junior high school, right? We're told that the square roots, so for instance, you want to print, uh, we're told that the square roots of, okay, let me use markdown this time. In, in, junior high school right i mean was even junior high school in high school at large in high school in high school in high school you know 
it was it was impossible it was impossible to solve to solve you know imagine whenever you had uh, to solve this okay let me double the dollar signs it was impossible to solve x squared plus four equals zero you know so it was impossible to solve that um let me make it mark down you know, I, I had a video on how to navigate Jupyter Notebook. So you can check all these things I'm doing. If, it, if they are strange to you, you can check the second video on Jupyter Notebook. So uh, so if you want to write a question, you use Markdown. So in high school, it was impossible to solve x squared plus 4 equals 0, right? Because, you know, as you proceeded, you know, that would be like, um, that would be like you have, okay, let me just keep copying and pasting this. So it would be like you have x squared x squared equals minus four x squared equals minus four you know that was what you had and then you the next thing is you want to find the square root of that right you know um if you go again and you have so x x alone then becomes what it becomes the square roots the square roots of minus four the square root of minus four you know and as far as we're concerned in high school, it was impossible. So it was impossible to solve this. Let me go down. It was impossible. Okay, well, I mean, I've already said that. So it was actually impossible to solve that. So that was it. But then I got into the university and I got introduced to the concept of complex numbers. So I got introduced to the, to the idea of complex numbers. So that takes us to complex numbers. So in Python, a complex number is a built-in data type that represents a complex number with a real and imaginary part. Complex numbers are used in mathematical operations involving imaginary quantities, and they are represented in Python using J or J suffix to, the, to indicate the imaginary part. It should be noted that J. So I got to secondary school, and then you know uh, we began to see that X equals square root of minus four. I mean, okay, let me just finish this talk, then I'll just talk about that. So J now is square root of minus one. Generally speaking, a complex number is of this form. That Z is X, X is the real part. Y is the imaginary part because it is attached to J, which is the square root of minus one. So you now say where X is the real part and Y is the imaginary part. So to create a complex number in pattern, you can use the complex function and pass it in the real. Okay, well, before I even continue with that, uh, with this, the rest of that story, right? So with this idea now, you know, we can now deal with it. We can now solve this problem. So with complex numbers, okay. So um, after this now, okay, let me create something at the top of this probably. Okay, uh, I run this. Okay, let me create a cell at the top and say, with complex numbers, with complex numbers, it is now possible, it is now possible to solve, to solve this. It is now possible to solve this. Okay, I mean, that should be marked down. That's why it's, it's not uh, doing well. So it should be marked down, not code. Um, where is it now? Okay, so here, so now it should be marked down. So, so with complex number, it is not possible to solve this because this is just simply now the same thing as, um, you know, we can say it is now square roots. You know, this is square root of minus four on its own, right? So square root of minus four now can be broken down into square root of square root of four times times square root of minus one, right? You can see that it is square root of four times square root of minus one. And now we know square root of four is two and square root of minus one is now J, all right? Or you can call it I. You know, uh, normally we can call it I, but you know, because of electrical engineers, right? We call it, uh, because electrical engineers use I for current, then we call it J. So now this is equal to square root of four is two, square root of minus one is J or I, if you like. And then, so complex numbers has now finally helped us to solve that impossible problem in high school. 
I mean, at least the high school I attended, I don't know, maybe in other parts of the world, they, 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 they've all already been introduced to the concepts of complex numbers. Okay. So talking about complex numbers, right? We already said it that, okay, I guess I need to break this away. Um, okay. I guess I need to take this and put it at the top of this so we can continue the flow. Uh, okay, no control. Uh, uh, let me put it back. Okay, I guess this is what I needed to do. Okay, this can come. Okay, I think this is the last line from here. I want to bring it. I want to break it away from that place and put it on top of this. So on top of this. Okay. Yeah, escape A bring something on top. And escape M makes it marked down, and we run that. Okay, good. So to create a complex number in Python, you can use the complex function and pass in the real and imaginary parts as arguments. So for instance, uh, my so if I have if I have so if my my complex is a variable name, you know. So my complex equals complex i a complex one comma two. So that means we are simply saying uh the complex number is one plus two j. Actually, you can write it directly, but I mean using complex is also another way to do it. You know, one thing about coding or some kind of programming is that there are more, more several ways of doing one thing. But I mean, as you get more advanced, you get to find the optimal way, the best way of doing what you have to do. So that's it. So what I'm what I do when I teach Python is I try I expose people to every possibility so you can settle for what works best for you. So for me, I like the easiest ways. So instead of using complex, I would rather just write it directly because it is also okay. So in this example, which is my complex here, uh, so my complex is the variable name and one and two are the real and imaginary parts of the complex number respectively. So one is the real part, as you can see here, two is the imaginary part because it's one attached to J, which is minus one. So you can actually perform various mathematical operations on complex numbers, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division using arithmetic operators like plus, minus, uh, slash, and so on and so forth, you know? So, um, in the future, probably we are going to encounter some problems in scientific computing uh, that we, that will require us to do all of those things. Um, you remember that in engineering, uh, comp complex issues like this arise a lot, and physics too. So, uh, so let's continue with this idea. So x is complex one, so that's one plus two j. Y is complex three, four. That should be three plus four j. Z is x plus y. That means you can add the two together, so you have one plus three, four, two plus four, six. So if you now print z, you have um you have the result, okay? Because X is one plus two J based on complex one to complex three, four, that's three plus four J. If you add the two together, that means add the imaginary parts and add the add the real parts and add the imaginary parts and you have four plus six J. So another thing you can do with this is you can also access the real and imaginary parts of a complex number using the real and uh, real and imag attributes. For instance, you have my complex one, that's complex one to one plus two J. My complex two that's complex three comma minus five which is three minus five j. You have comp my complex three that is my complex one plus my complex two that's what we want to do. We could as well say subtraction, right? So if you do subtraction, you just subtract corresponding uh, real and imaginary numbers. So since we are adding one plus three is four, two plus minus five that's two two minus five that's minus three j. So if you add this two, you actually get four minus three j. So if you print my complex three, it gives you four minus three j. But then if you want to access just the real part, you know, sometimes, for instance, in stability analysis, I'm sure we're going to get there as we go on in scientific computing. In stability analysis, right, uh, we determine the stability of a system by the real part. So you may want to be interested in just the real part in some cases. So if you want to extract the real part, just say the real part equals my complex three dot real. So that helps you to extract the real part, which is four. If you want the imaginary part, you can say imag part is my complex three dot imag. You know, these uh, variable names can be anything, but this uh, syntax must be, is, is necessary because you can see the real and image, they have special colors. So it means that's how they are used. So the imaginary part will now be minus three based on what you see. So, and then you can now see the, the real part is this, the imaginary part is that. Let's go for that, you know? So you see the complex, my complex three, which is the addition of the first two is four minus three J. The real part is four. The imaginary part is minus three. And that may be necessary in some cases to, if you, because you want to extract some things. Okay. So in addition, right, 
Python provides some built-in functions for working with complex numbers, such as ABS. ABS is absolute. So for calculating the absolute value, which is the magnitude of a complex, and, and, and it also has, has a conjugate, for calculating the conjugate of a complex, that is the neg negates the imaginary part. So the absolute of an imaginary number is actually, uh, you know, take, so if you have the absolute three plus four J now, that's absolute value of three plus four, which is the same thing as square root of three squared plus four squared. Three squared is nine, four squared is 16. Nine plus 16 is 25, square root of 25 is five. That's why the absolute of three plus four J is five. All right. And then the conjugate, conjugate is just you changing whatever the sign of uh, the complex part is just changing. Then you get the conjugate of the matrix, I mean, the conjugate of the complex number rather. So if you have a complex number A equals three plus four J, so the absolute I've just demonstrated that to be that it's going to be five. And then if you, see, if you print the absolute, it gives you that five. Then if conjugate of A is A dot conjugate. So to get absolute, just A, B, S of A, then conjugate, just say A dot conjugate. And then it gives you, in the, conjugate is just changing the sign. So three plus four, it becomes three minus four. So if you run this, it gives you those results. So the absolute is five. And I've told you the process of absolute. Then it conjugate is changing the sign of the imaginary part. So you have those two. So that's another type of variable. So then we have booleans, booleans. So, I mean, this happens, this is very useful in, uh, in computer logic, for instance. So Booleans are used in programming to make logical decisions and control the flow of program execution. They are used to store values that are either true or false. So in Boolean algebra, you are, act, you are storing true or false values. So you're evaluating, uh, things to this, to see whether they are true or false. In two, I mean, two videos from now, I believe I'll be talking about Python operations. So you're going to see some Boolean operations. You know, I'm also going to be talking about uh, things like arithmetic operation in and not in operation and things like that. So watch out for that video. That'll be the video after the one after this one. <laughs> I hope that's not confusing. OK, so for instance, if you say X is true and Y is false, if you check the type, the type of variable that X is because it's storing true as a value, you know, it tells you it's Boolean. OK, Boolean does bool for short. So if you come to if you take another cell, and now check type Y, type Y, you know, type Y, and you run that too. It's also Boolean, all right? So a, a, a good example is this. If I have A is 7 and B is minus 7. So let me take this away for now because I'm going to do that in another cell. So if A is 7 and B is minus 7, so I want to evaluate the, the result of A less than B. Is A actually less than B? A is 7, B is minus 7. Uh, so... Well, I know that seven is positive and B uh, A is positive seven, B is negative seven. So uh se seven cannot be less than minus seven. So because seven is greater than minus seven, so that's gonna be false, right? So that's false. So if I what about if I do this? I want to evaluate the 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 logic of A. Now A equals absolute of B is you assigning absolute of B to A. But when you use two equalities, so you can see one equality is assignment, but two equality is a kind of Boolean evaluation. So if you, if I have just one equality sign, it's going to give me an issue. So if I have one equality sign, it's going to give like some kind of error. You can see A is an invalid keyword argument for print. So in that case, what I need is Boolean. So double equality rather, the equality like that, double equality. So when you put double equality, what you are doing is A equal equal absolute B. What you are simply doing is you are saying, is A equal to absolute of B? That's what you are doing. Is A equals the absolute of B? You know, the absolute of A is 7. B is minus 7. The absolute of B is also 7. So it means A will be equal to the absolute of B. So that expression is going to be true. And then when you run that, it's true. So with this, I come to the end of Python variable data types. Now, they are actually strings, but I mean, strings... Is not so useful when we talk about ah oh, well maybe we're going to find the usefulness at some point if if it comes up I might have to talk about it but for now I believe uh, we don't have so much to do with strings as a variable type but at least don't forget that it, we also have strings as Python variable data type. Thank you so much for listening all this while. If you have not subscribed, be sure to subscribe because uh you you will you have a lot to learn and of course I also make this very practical because you can download the. Python files I'm using and try them out on your own. So you can now go back and check all these variables, use different values, create a new, create new cells and try these things out. So be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell 
So you can always get videos when I upload, uh, 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 alerted about new videos when I upload them. Then don't forget to comment, like, and share so that we can keep learning together. Thank you so much for listening. See you in the next video.